Hello and welcome to Handheld Computing. Today we're having a look at the Philips Velo 1. This is part of the first wave of Windows CE devices, so it runs Windows CE 1. It was released in 1997. To put that in perspective, the Scion 3C was released the year before in 1996, and the Series 5 was released the same year, 1997. The Velo came with CE 1.0. Given the competition from Scion at the time, I don't think it's too much of a surprise that later the same year it came bundled with a free upgrade to Windows CE 2. In a future video, I'll do a side-by-side -side comparison of the Velo 1 with CE 1 and CE 2 installed so we can see how much of an upgrade CE 2 actually was. So let's take a look at the box. As you can see, this is the 4 megabyte version and we've got a couple of stickers on the front, one for a free modem. Although the Velo has a software modem built into its CPU, so actually it's just a cable or a connector. Um, and we've also got a sticker down here for the upgrade to 8 megabyte and a free Windows CE2 upgrade. The 8 megabyte upgrade is actually an 8 megabyte RAM card, so you end up with 12 meg of memory. But let's have a look at the bottom. We can see this lists all the different features, tells us about the RAM and the processor that's in there um, and we've got various bits about the LCD display, the applications that are built in um, and things like that. Then on the side we've got the minimum requirements for the computer so you need a Pentium 90 or better and you need at least 8 meg of memory although 12 is recommended. So this won't connect to Windows 10, doesn't matter what you do, it just won't do it, um, but you can connect it to up to XP. Um, top has got the same information as the bottom, side has just got a sticker on and a thing telling us it's 4 meg with the dock, and then we come to the rear. So I think they've tweaked the contrast on the screen for this picture. We've got a feature list, so it talks about the voice memo, which is unique to this. It's built by Philips. Um, you can run Windows anywhere. I mean, we know this isn't quite true. Um, we've got communications enabled. This means talking to um, the computer or with a modem to uh, the internet. Uh, best in class performance. I mean, that is debatable. International keyboard. Expandable and upgradable. You can add additional memory and upgrade your software by simply inserting standard miniature cards. Very standard, I don't think they've existed for a very long time. Some quick start keys. This is my personal favourite, on-demand backlighting. The backlit display makes it easy to run Windows anytime, even when the lighting conditions aren't perfect. In an aeroplane, at the pool, in a convention centre, or even at night. I would not recommend taking this to the pool, and I think it's ambitious to say that you could use this in um, anything but good lighting conditions. Mentions the dock and the synchronization. So let's have a quick look inside the box. So in here we've got this really horrible Velo case. I mean, it's like rubber. Anyway, not very nice, but we've got that. We've got the dock. Obviously, RS-232 connector. And then in the bottom of here... So I've actually got the upgrades to CE2. So that's the 8 meg DRAM card. The industry standard. And this is the flash card with the upgrade to Windows CE2. Um, so I've not put it in yet, as you can see. I've also got a floppy disk. Everyone loves a floppy disk. And this is so you can connect it up to the phone. There's the CD for the upgrade, um, so we can install CE2, but we'll do that at a later date. I've got my worldwide guarantee, very important. I imagine I won't be able to call on that anymore. Some of the bits about dial-up connections, again, not really bothered. There's a, a Windows CE2 guide, so this came with the upgrade, just to tell you a bit about it and how to do it. blah -de blah Handheld companion. I've not even this hasn't even been opened, um, but again that's got my vision and um, 2.1 certificate. So we'll have a look at that later. Microburst virtual courier user guide. What on earth is that? 
Oh, we'll just leave that. And um, there's a power brick in there. We've got a phone connector, an adapter to go RS232 to parallel port. And that is my modem connector. Perhaps in the future I might see if I can find a dial-up connection to dial into. Anyway, so let's take a look at the unit itself. So we've got a button on the top for cancelling alarms. If we swing to the front, we've got the release catch to open the lid. We've got some indicators. Um, we've got power for when the batteries are low, we've got a synchronization indicator, and we've got an alarm indicator. There's a little hole there, that's for the microphone. As we come around the side, we've got a dial which adjusts the contrast of the screen, and we can see the stylus silo on the back. This is where the batteries go, just a pair of double A's, so nothing fancy. And on the other side, we've got the modem cable, we've got the connector for the dock, and we've got the power jack underneath. We've got the two memory card slots. We've got a connector, which I assume is for some other kind of dock or something. I, I don't recognize it as a connector, but that's there and I didn't find anything in the um, uh, information. That's the backup battery panel, which is screwed in. And also, so this is the RAM slot. So it's got two torque screws holding it down as well as a normal screw. Obviously you don't want your RAM dropping out when you're using it. But on the memory card slot, so the flash removable storage, um, they've also put a torque screw. And um, so clearly they weren't expecting you to be swapping memory cards in and out like you would perhaps on your Scion with your compact flash card. We've got the speaker holes there. And if we spin it back round and open it up, you can see the keyboard. We've got the backlight button. And um, we've got all the application buttons. The hinge on these is odd, it opens fully and it's got no resistance. I assume when it was new that you could stand it at an angle, but that's no longer possible. It just opens fully. Put some batteries in, we'll power it up for the first time. So let's take a look at the standard applications. We'll work our way just to log the uh, shortcut bar. So we'll start with Pocket Word. Pocket Word in CE1 is very basic. We've got quite a few fonts. We can alter the size. Um, we've got bold, italics, underlines, and some positions. We can also bullet point things. There's a few things you can't do. So the first is, Obviously, we can create new, open, save. We can only save as pocket word or a text document. So you can't save as an RTF. In the edit, we've got standard edit options, including find and replace. In view, we've just got normal outline and whether we want to wrap to window or not. So there's no print preview. There's no zoom functionality. There's no ability to add pictures or drawings or anything like that. It is very basic. Given that the Scion 3C and the Scion 5, which came out the same year, um, can both do all of those functions, it does make you wonder what Microsoft were thinking. Let's move on. Pocket Excel is much the same. It's a standard Excel spreadsheet. Um, we've got new, open, save, save as, and the only option in save as is Pocket Excel. We can't export or anything like that. Moving on, we've got edit. Uh, we've got the usual ones, find and replace, copy, etc, etc. There's quite a few um, functions in terms of in self-formatting. You can have number functions and currency and accounting and there's the usual formatting functions, fonts, and we can add borders, but you can't add any shading, so you can't fill boxes, for example, if you wanted a gray shaded box or something like that. Under tools, we've got insert function, and there's plenty of functions there. So I think for the average user, there's more than enough power here. One of the things that is missing is the ability to make any graphs. Windows CE never adds uh, graphs to Excel, which I find very odd as it's aimed at business users. Moving on, we've got the calendar. There are three views, and um, so we've got the standard day view. We've got a week view, so it shows when you're busy. Um, and we've got this view, 
I'm not sure if this is unique to Philips, as this doesn't reappear in any of the standard calendar applications after this. But what we've got is a list of events and a list of active tasks down the side. So a handy overview. And there's a couple of buttons so we can scroll backwards and forwards. That's all the available views. We don't gain the ability to view a month at a glance, which I must admit is quite lacking. But it works, so that's fine. There's a couple of options here to jump. Um, to the day and we can select half hour slots if we want. Again, we've got cut, copy and paste. The appointments is very similar to um, future iterations. We get a description, a location, we can set times, have it all day, have it repeat, set reminders, all the usual things. There is a notes box down at the bottom and there's a bunch of options for reoccurring. Uh, one of the things you can't do is, is write on the screen, so later iterations allow you to handwrite notes to go in your agenda file, but that's fine. When it comes to tasks, we've got the usual options. Um, when we create a task, you can add priorities, you can put projects. I mean, this is just a way of categorizing them, isn't it? Reminders, recurrence and notes. Talking of tasks, don't forget to subscribe. Of course, then you can be in to be in part of the competition on the 20th of October, which is the anniversary and a bit more on that later. And because it's just a nice list view, it's very easy to sort your tasks by preferences, by due dates or by project. So actually, this is quite a well developed application. It didn't really get much tweaking in later versions, and I don't think it needed much, to be honest. We've got a couple of options here so we can clear them out and delete the completed tasks, edit tasks and show the edit panel like so. Next up we come to Internet Explorer. Given how poor Internet Explorer on the desktop is, I don't think we really need to discuss this for, for long. So we'll just move straight on onto Inbox. So this is the built-in email client. It will synchronize with Microsoft Exchange, but it will only really cope with text-based emails. Any attachments would need copying separately and convert into some readable format. If you do have a dial-up connection, you can use it to directly collect emails using the 14.4 kilobit modem. So the database software is worth having a closer look at. It's not part of the CE formula. It's made by Allpen but it's a very straightforward, easy to use database program, which presumably was licensed to Philips. So if we create a new database, we'll leave it as that. And um, you've then got these various options as to what you want. So you can have text fields, a note, which is like a text, but longer. Um, text is limited to 255 characters, but note is not limited as much. And um, we've got number views. We've got real, which is for real numbers. We've got date, which can be set to add the today's date as a standard thing. Then we've got a radio button, a checkbox and a pop up list. Super. So we've created a database and you can create as many of these as you like. You can delete them. You can even go back and edit them, but you will lose data if you either delete fields or amend fields to a different form type. So I've put a couple of entries in. I'll just show you how to add a new entry. It's quite straightforward. Control and N or you can use the edit view to add something. Pop something in. Uh, in the so this is limited to 255 uh, the notes you can put seemingly as much as you like in I've not really found the limit for that I've put a priority here so this is a radio button and you can just select one of these and um, there's a tick box to say you've done and I've put a pop-up in so actually if you were out in the field collecting data about something doing research for example you could fill this in on the fly very easily and you could create your own custom database to deal with it Hitting enter adds it to the list. You can then choose how to sort it. You can search for things, although it won't look for things in the notes field. It will only look in subjects or date or other text fields. If it's in the memos uh, field, the note field, it will not find it. And then you can choose whether it's up or down. We've got a couple of tools, so we're back to their sort and find view. We can list them. That's basically the view 
um, uh, and then we can select new record and look at field definitions, which is the way that you would edit it. All in all, quite a powerful piece of software and considering that this was aimed at business users, again, I find it odd that it's not really mentioned on the box. I would have thought this would have been a selling point, particularly for businesses, but hey ho. Next on our list, we've got calculator. Pretty standard, just a calculator. You can set it to pop up if you want it over the top of something, which could be useful. You can't flip it left and right, nor can you program it, unlike on a Scion 2. The last of our shortcuts is the voice memo. So again, this is a Philips product. This isn't from Microsoft. Um, so we've got a couple of options, uh, record, play, rename, move, delete, empty deleted items. We can folder things, so categorize them basically. And um, we've got a couple of tools and um, you can adjust the audio levels. There's no way of cropping or splitting or doing anything else. Um, and there's a help folder. So pretty good. Just a shame they didn't put any external access to it like we see in later Pocket PCs, HPCs, and in the Scion 5. Heading to the Start menu, you can see we've got various options. We've got Explorer programs, Document, Settings, Help, Run, and Suspend. There's no cascading menus, so if we go to Programs, it just opens new folders. So we'll have a quick look. So we've got accessories, we've got the calculator, the welcome and the world clock, nothing too exciting there. In communication, uh, we've got uh, inbox, uh, pocket internet explorer, we've got the PC link settings, uh, remote networking and a terminal so that you can do command line on another computer. Under games, of course we have solitaire, standard for any Microsoft product, and who doesn't love a quick game of solitaire? Heading back, we come to the Velo applications. So, not only did Philips add a voice memo and a nice database software, they also added BFAX Pro, which allows you to send faxes, and BView, which allows you to read faxes that you've received. There's a reset button, which just does a soft reset, and there's also this key map, which lives down here, so it's always launched. It describes itself as being useful for inputting accented characters. I find it's quite useful if you're doing something in the dark and you want to be able to copy something into a program but you can't see your keyboard. So it's kind of handy that it's hanging around there. Heading into settings. We've got the usual, we can change the timing for the backlight. Um, we've got the infrared and communication setup. The display just allows you to um, uh, change the uh, background. It's a bit like classic windows, so we can tile the background like so and we can just use this contrast image in order to help us get the contrast right. We've also got uh, keyboard options, change how long it takes to repeat, etc, etc. Um, owner information, password, power, which tells you when the backlight will go or suspend, uh, regional settings, Remove applications, stylus calibration, system settings, which just tells us that we've got CE1 and we've got four meg of RAM. There's also the memory bar slider here, so you can adjust how much RAM you're using. So we're using about 600 meg. We've got volume, so you can have screen clicks or not. And you can change some of your sounds a bit like you can in Windows. And last but not least, the world clock. So there must be about three links to that. Just to show you the backlight works, there it is in glorious green, and I would say it was instant on, so the packaging doesn't lie. So with the Velo One, I feel Philips managed to plug some of the important gaps in Microsoft fledgling operating system. And while the keys are a little bit squishy, they do give good feedback and it's quite easy to type on. In general, programs are launched fast and it feels quite snappy, even though it's only a 38 megahertz CPU. Given that this was Microsoft's first attempt at a handheld computing platform, I think they did quite a good job. I can forgive them for lacking some options. The 3, when it was released by Scion, that lacked options. You can see the evolutionary curve as you reach the 3C and then onto the Series 5. And they've been in the marketplace for a long time. I can also forgive the lack of removable storage. It perhaps isn't such an issue as long as you've got a dock at home and perhaps one at work so you can synchronize files and move things backwards and forwards. 
In my mind, the biggest issue with this machine by far is the poor contrast of the screen. It makes it difficult to read in anything but good light conditions, and while there is a backlight, that poor contrast still means it's difficult to read. Philips only ever made two handheld PCs and two palm-sized PCs before leaving this crowded sector. It's a shame, really, because they've already shown with the Velo one right at the beginning their ability to go beyond the limitations of the stock OS, and I think they could have done great things. But that's how it goes. Perhaps you had one of these, perhaps you still use one of these. I'd love to hear some comments from you if you do or you did, or perhaps you just envied people who had them at the time. If that sounds like you, leave a comment below. So just a reminder, the 20th of October marks the first full year of handheld computing. I'm very pleased how things are going. Um, I don't release too many videos as you probably know, um, but uh, I'm enjoying making them and I'm going to keep at it. As my way of saying thanks, I'm going to do a bit of a giveaway. So I've got one of these, an HP RZ1710. I'm going to bundle it up with a cradle, a power supply and an SD card with a bunch of programs pre-installed. I might put Age of Empires on there if I can get it working. So just make sure that you've subscribed so you don't miss that video. And otherwise, I'll see you next time. My name's Hugh. This is Handheld Computing.